Okay, so just to recap, you know, what we have done in optical flow is look at the brightness constancy equation. We are saying, given a pixel in frame one, its intensity, if you compare the pixel in this next frame exactly around that same location with small change, dx and dy, then it should be constant. It should not change that much. And using that, we came up with this equation, fxu plus fiv is equal to minus ft. And we used Horn and Shank method. Horn and Shank method was variational calculus. It takes all these equations, all the pixels, and um, put a second constraint that optical flow should be smooth and obtain the uh, iterative algorithm to compute u and v in the iterative fashion. Then we talk about lucas Canade method, uh, which look at a small neighborhood, get um, multiple equations for a two unknowns, u, v, assuming the optical flow in a three by three or five by five neighborhood is constant. Then you can do the least square fit and compute u, v. Um, then we talk about that if the motion is large, then we won't be able to compute the correct optical flow because all these are depend on the local spatial temporal derivative looking at a small neighborhood. They won't be able to distinguish between small motion, large motion, and that's the aperture problem. Um, so we use Gaussian, uh, the pyramids, which can help us to reduce the motion different levels of pyramid. Each level of pyramid reduce the motion half in x and y. And um, so um, now we are going to talk about a global motion. So this motion, the optical flow, is a local motion. Every pixel we have a vector, uv. Now we want to talk about the global motion uh, in which all the pixels will be used and we'll get the um, motion from frame one to two and this will be a call parametric flow. And we have an equation of optical flow for the whole image where we can just plug in any particular pixel values and we'll find the motion. And um, those parametric flow will have different forms. One is called affine, other is called projective. And um, the reason we want to do it, the global motion it has lots of applications. One is that if you are taking a video, camera is moving, so it has a global motion, and then people start moving, there's a local motion of these objects. So in order to analyze that video, we need to get rid of global motion. For example, if UAV is flying, then it's capturing the motion of the cars and people and so on, but the global motion is moving also. So we want to get rid of the global motion and then focus on the motion of the objects. Um, and um, if you want to segment, we want to look at the moving objects. In the searching object, again, we want to compensate for global motion because with that UAV videos, every pixel is moving. Some pixels are moving due to motion of the objects and motion of camera. Some pixels are moving because of just motion of the camera. So um, we can take a video and stitch these images together and make a mosaic. And that will be finding the global transformation from this frame to that frame and that frame. So it's useful there also. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about 3D rigid motion model and we'll talk about the rotation transformation, a rotation matrix using Euler angles orthographic perspective projection, and displacement model and instantaneous model. There are two different models. And affine transformation, homography, and least square fit. Again, we'll revisit that. So that's a pretty fundamental uh, set of concepts which um, we will cover here. Again, they are very simple. So let's look at uh, 3D rigid motion. You know, so if the um, the body is rigid, suppose if I take this table, it's a rigid. Uh, I'm non-rigid, you know, humans are non-rigid articulation. Chair is rigid. So take a chair and put it somewhere here. So it's a called rigid motion. Uh, or if I take these glasses here, then move here. 
So this motion in 3D, this motion is 3D because we have X, Y, and Z. So motion in 3D can be described by 3D rotation, 3D translation. So let's say we have this coordinate system x, y, z at time t1 and when you and suppose this coordinate system attached to the object now when we move then the coordinate system is moving and this is different compared this one compared to the world coordinate system so let's say world coordinate here the corner and I have um, some some object here so I get its location and I have coordinate system attached to that then I move like this, then this coordinate system x, y, z, this changes and we want to talk about how to model that. And this is important for the computer graphics, computer vision, and robotics and so on. Yeah. So we're always interested in the global uh, coordinate system or also in the local uh, coordinate system? Yeah, so, so one is that, you know, coordinate system at the end will be with respect to some word coordinate and um, but right now we are assuming, let's say, the coordinate systems attached to the object, and we want to rotate the object, we want to translate the object, and uh, we want to relate those. Now, once we understand that, we can say now, coordinate system rotate the camera, and we want to rotate the camera and translate and so on. So it's all relative. Okay, so um, so the. To relate these motion, um, so let's say at time t1, the origin of the coordinate system of an object is x, y, z. Then at time t2, it's at x prime, y prime, z prime, as was shown here. Okay. So now, how do we relate x, y, z with x prime, y prime, z? The way to relate is that we will do the rotation R, X, Y, Z multiplied by R plus translation X, Y, Z. So this is called rotation matrix, this is called the translation vector, and that is the new location, which is the X, y, X prime, Y prime, Z prime rotation. Now in this we have nine unknowns because it's three by three matrix, and uh, then we have three unknowns, which are the translation. Okay, so the way it is that x prime will be x r11 y plus r12 y plus r13 z plus tx, and similarly this will become x r21 y r22 z r23 plus ty, and so on. So um, now let's talk about how we can come up with the rotation matrix. And uh, <clears throat> what we are going to do to look at this um, coordinate system x, y, z. And let's look at the vector here, which is shown. This vector is x, y, z, uh, its coordinates. This is x axis, this is y axis, and z axis. So we are rotating this vector around z axis. Z axis is coming out. And that after rotation, this vector becomes, which is shown at here, and becomes x prime, y prime, z prime. So it's a rotation around like this, z axis, z axis like that. So now we are rotating by angle theta. That's what it is, you know. Okay, and the original angle this vector was making, let's say, x axis was phi. And the length of this vector is r. So when we rotate, the length will not change. After rotation, length will be also R. So now what we have, we have two triangles, which is this one and uh, this one. And uh, we can find out the X prime, Y prime, Z prime, given the angle of rotation, which is theta, and the original coordinates X, Y, Z, using these two triangles. Because if you look at, um, this x here, which is the before the rotation, this is uh, angle phi, and this is the base of this triangle, so it will become r cos phi. 
y will be r sine phi. It's a very simple triangle. Yes? Now, if you look at the bigger triangle, which is shown here after the rotation, now angle is phi plus theta. So we can do the same thing. The x prime, which is uh, this much, will be r cosine of theta plus phi. And y prime, which is this one, will be r sine of theta plus phi, because this triangle has a two angles in the summation. And we know that if you sum cosine of two, two angles is the cosine of first, cosine of second, minus sine of first, sine of second. And the sine of two angles, theta plus five, is the sine of theta, cosine of theta, and then plus cosine of theta and sine of five. This is the simple uh, geometry you learned in the middle school. So now what we have, is x prime <coughs> is given by r cos theta cos phi minus r sine theta sine phi and similarly we have y prime but in this case as you know the r cos phi is x from the above here and r sine phi is y so we can replace that and then we get simpler expression which is from here we get um, r cosine phi become x and cosine theta minus r sine phi become y sine theta. And same way for y prime r cosine phi become x then sine theta and r sine phi become y cosine theta. So now if we know the coordinates before the rotation x, y, if you know the angle of rotation, we can find out x prime, y prime. Now, the z prime is actually exactly the same as z because when you're rotating now z-axis, the z does not change, okay? So that is the simple rotation around z-axis, and the rotation is around counterclockwise direction. You know, clock goes this way, and now it's going this way. So it's important that you have to know which direction you are rotating. So we can write down this in rotation matrix like that that we have x, y, z, and cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, like that. Multiply this, then we get x prime, y prime. And z prime is, is equal to z. It does not change. This is 0, 0, and z. So that is just rotation on y, uh, z axis. So um, then we can have an easy way to, you know, come up with these rotation matrices around any axis, you know, like um, the y-axis and so on. So now what we are going to do is um, we are going to put the two coordinate system. One is x, y, z that we have been looking at. And we will assume this imaginary unit coordinate system, which we will call u, v, w. And their unit that this length is 1, 1, 1. So when we are rotating, we are going to actually rotate this UVW and um, see how that behaves. Now, there's no rotation. So therefore, we can write down U has the component around x-axis. So it'll become 1, 0, 0. It doesn't have any component on y-axis, no component on z-axis. V does not have component on x-axis and it has component y, 1 on v, y axis and z 0, so 0, 1, 0, and this is 0, 0, 1. So this is the identity matrix and there's no rotation. The UVW is aligned with x, y, z, okay? So now let's say we rotate now in the, around the z axis as we are doing. So now u become u prime because we are rotating like this v become v prime, we are rotating like that, and of course w is, remains the same. So now what we are going to do, we'll write down the u prime, v prime, and w prime in terms of those columns of that matrix. Suppose when you look at the u prime, it has two components, and one is the x component, and this is one, so this will become cosine of this angle, which is the, which is the theta, y component will become sine of theta and it doesn't have z component 
and here we are going to look at the uh, V prime which is the component um, in the X direction which is the minus and this is minus sine theta and then it has component around the Y axis which is this gun. So, so the first column is cosine theta sine theta zero which is this one u prime and second is this one which is minus sine theta which is the x component and cosine theta y component and z zero and the w prime doesn't change so therefore zero zero one so we can easily write down this rotation matrix by imagining this rotation of this unit coordinate system uvw superposed on original x y z and um, now we can do that now if you are going to rotate around y axis so, and suppose we are going to rotate in the clockwise direction so again we look at the top one uvw there and we are going to rotate around y axis which means y will remain constant so u here will come like this and then w will come somewhere here okay so that's what is shown here so and the y will become same well, constant will not change so again to find the rotation matrix around y axis in the direction of the clockwise direction we can find the the u prime its coordinates in x y z v prime that will become second column and w prime which will be third column and to make it easy we can actually look at like this one because this is now x axis which is this one and z axis which is going like that now this uh, is our u prime and has two components one around x axis and other around z axis and this will become cosine theta and this will become sine theta okay so that's what we have x component and z component y component is zero because we are rotating on z axis similarly here z um, the w prime so this has the minus x component which is this minus sine and then this has the um, the uh, z component this is the x component and this is the z component which is around this which is the cosine in angle we have rotated a beta in the clockwise direction so this will become minus sine beta this component here because in positive x is here negative x is there and this becomes cosine of beta which is here so you can come up with all these matrices by taking these columns like that yeah this is probably a very stupid question but yeah uh, could be like you and uh, the the angle for moving you different than the angle that we're moving uh, around the you can area. pick anyone you like so it could be yeah could be alpha and yeah be exactly that's what we are going to do actually this is just a, any angle you pick so we are going to look at the cosine of that angle sine of that angle so okay any other question so the clockwise rotation and the anti uh, anti clockwise rotation have the same result no it's opposite see the 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 what's going to happen that if you <clears throat> this one is clockwise rotation around y axis okay now if you if you do this rotation on clockwise anti clockwise direction counter clockwise direction on y axis it'll be inverse of that actually transpose of that and you can try that out so the good thing about these matrices are they are orthogonal matrices so to find the rotation matrix around y axis in the counter clock direction simple way will be wherever you have beta put a minus beta so it will become cosine of minus beta sine of minus beta minus sine of minus beta and cosine of minus beta and what is the cosine of minus beta hmm? say it again is it which doesn't change right yeah, and then sine of minus beta minus, minus sine beta. beta and minus of sine of beta will become the because sine of minus beta is minus pi minus, minus multiply by minus is plus and then cosine of minus beta again the same thing 
So if you take those, oh, I forgot again, bring the, bring the marker. Does anybody have marker? If, if you just do that and you get two matrices multiplied, you'll get identity. Hey, can you remind me, can you bring the marker next time? The marker, yeah? Only have permanent Okay, so don't do that. But, but, but do it, it's, it's very simple. See, so, so put a minus everywhere, you get a matrix, you take this matrix, multiply, you will get identity. Which makes sense that you are rotating in the clockwise direction on Y, then other one is saying rotating in the counterclockwise direction on Y. So you're this way, they're right back in your same place, which means you are not rotating, which is identity. And that's what you are getting get. get. Okay? Um, so that's, you know, it's this good thing, the rotation matrices. So now these were just rotation around specific angle. But arbitrary rotation, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be rotation around X, or Y, or Z. So for that, we are going to use what is called ILR angles. So we are going to say that any rotation around an arbitrary axis can be expressed as three primary rotations. The rotation around x-axis by some angle gamma, um, rotation around y-x followed by rotation on y-axis by angle beta, followed by rotation on z-axis by angle alpha. So that is the general rotation matrix which can describe any rotation around any axis, not necessarily around X or Y or Z. So what is saying that any rotation can be broken in these three rotations, small rotation, and they have to be followed in that order. So this is the um, matrix for rotation around the X axis, you know, you can say because X has not changed. Whenever you rotate around particular axis, that that column will not change. This is also X, this is always Y, this is always Z. This is the rotation on Y axis. Second column is chain, not chain, it's on Z axis. So we get these three matrices. There are three principal axes and principal rotation. We're going to multiply them, okay? And you can do this at home. You'll get this form. So again, it's a three by three matrix and we have nine elements and in this there are actually three uh, angles, three unknowns, sine, uh, the alpha, beta, gamma. These are rotation on these axes. But these are the nonlinear terms, you know, these are not linear. Sine and cosine, they are nonlinear. So that is um, called Euler angles. Now we are going to simplify that. We are going to say that if the angles are small, um, then let's say if the angle is zero, then cosine of zero is what? One. And sine of zero is? Zero. zero. So if the angles are small, then we can approximate cosine of the angle with one and sine of that angle with the angle itself. So cosine of alpha will become 1 and sine of beta will become beta. So that's true for the small angles. Okay? We are going to do this approximation uh, and this matrix will become much simpler. So, so that's what this is saying. If the angles are small, cosine of theta is 1 and sine of theta is theta. So it will become actually very simple. So see, if you see the first term, we have cos of alpha and cos of beta. When the angle is small, cos of alpha is one, cos of beta is one. One multiplied by one is we get first element there. The second element, cosine of alpha is one, sine of beta is beta, sine of gamma is gamma. Now small number multiplied by small number is again small, uh, therefore it becomes zero. So we get rid of the first term here, okay? Now the next term in this one, sine of alpha is alpha, cosine of gamma is one, so it become minus alpha. So that's what we got here, okay? We look at this one, 
we have cosine alpha is 1, sine of beta is beta, and cosine of gamma is 1, so it becomes beta, and then plus sine alpha, sine gamma, sine alpha is alpha, sine gamma is gamma, but these two are small numbers, you multiply them, it will be even small, so it becomes 0, so therefore we get beta from the first term here. And like that you can, you can come up with this. And now this is simple because it has only unknowns there, alpha, beta, gamma, and this is called rotation matrix using Euler angle. This is rotation on arbitrary axis. Yeah. Can you explain again why um, if you multiply alpha by gamma, like the sinus of alpha times sinus of gamma should be alpha times gamma, but then you neglect it? Which one? This one here? The last, the last one yeah. uh, on the top row. And yeah. then the, after the, plus, the first one should be beta, right? Yeah. And then the second one should be alpha times gamma. Second one, alpha times gamma, but alpha is small number and gamma is small number. If you take two small numbers, multiply them together, it will be even small. Suppose, suppose alpha is okay. 0.1, okay. gamma is 0.1, it will become 0.01. So, okay, yeah. So that's why we can ignore, okay? So that's nice. Okay. So, um, so now let's look at the, um, now this, this was a motion in the 3D. We did not talk about images. Now we're going to talk about images. Okay, so we're going to talk about, uh, when we take pictures, we're going to talk about projection, that how you take a picture. And as we discussed before, so one simple model is orthographic projection would do not depend on where the object is, it's just project, you know, on the image. It's not modified by the depth, like when you when the when you are looking at the from the above the air, then actually the height of the buildings and so on doesn't matter. So a simple model is that orthographic projection. And uh, in that case, you know, X is uh, and there's supposed to be here, X is equal to some scale version of x and y is equal also small y. So the word coordinate are mapped to the image coordinate without any modification on z. It does not depend on z because z is so far. So now when we are going to do the motion, so we have a rigid motion. So we have a time t1, x, y, z. After we rotate it, it becomes x prime, y prime, z prime. And um, we are saying after the projection, we can approximate the x coordinate image by word x and y coordinate image by word y. Then the um, essentially the x prime from using these equations will become x r11 plus y r12 plus ZR13 is equal to TX plus TX, which will be the multiplying this with the first row, adding this. And now the small x and small y we are going to replace instead of uppercase x and y. And then we have this term which involves Z, which is the C R13 multiplied by Z and plus TX. So this is the X bar coordinate in the second image. There's a Y bar coordinate in the second image under the orthograph projection where we assume we can approximate image coordinate. We are going to represent always with small x, small y, approximately equal to uppercase x and y. So using the rigid motion, using the orthograph projection, we can find out the coordinate of a point after the motion in the image which is x prime, y prime, in terms of its coordinate before the motion in this first image, x, y, and rotation elements, and then this term, which involves z and tx. So simple way to approximate that is what we are going to do is we are going to say that this is some constant b1. This is another constant b2. So we get x prime is equal to a1x plus a2y plus b1. So we are going to call this a1 and a2. And then this will become a3x and a4y and b2. 
So this is the 3D rigid motion under orthograph projection. This tells you how we can relate the coordinate in frame one, which is x, y, to frame two, coordinates in frame two, same point, x prime, y prime, in terms of this um, image motion. And this is called a fine transformation. Okay, so a fine transformation can be represented like that, that we take x, y, the first image corresponding coordinate, second image x prime, y prime, we apply this A matrix, A the B1, B2, and that is the affine transformation which has these six unknowns, four from the matrix, two from the translation. And we can also write down as a matrix form X prime is a vector, A is a matrix, B, X is a vector, and B is a vector. And it's a very more simple model in the image under orthograph projection under the rigid motion. Lots of simplification we have done here. Okay? Yes? X prime, Y prime, Z prime are the coordinates of point uh, with respect to the second. No, no, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, so these are, you know, the, these image coordinates are with respect to each image. So, and suppose they are exactly same size, so the coordinate origin in the image one, image one is, image two is exactly same. Okay? So. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, coordinate system is same. The first image, second image, center is same, center is same. It's just pixel numbers, you know, rows, columns, x, y is rows, column, same size, same origin. So we take a point, say x, y, say 30 and 20, and then we um, take the corresponding point where it moved in second image, say x prime, y prime. Then we on say, well, how can we find, given x, y, how can we find x prime, y prime. And we are saying, well, whenever there's a motion, the 3D motion can be modeled by the rigid transformation. There's a translation, there's a rotation, there's the first one. Then we say, well, this is now motion is an images. So then what is the image projection model? So simplest model is the orthograph projection. And we are saying small x, small y, which are the image coordinates, can be approximately equal to uppercase X and Y. And there's no Z in the image, so we can get rid of that. You just explain it that, simplify, and come up with a fine transformation. Okay? So, um, so the, the other way to do this will be also, we can look at the, um, the Euler angle rotation, because earlier there we just look at the general rotation matrix, which is nine unknowns, no? So we can do the same thing, the Euler angles, and this will become X prime, Y prime, like that. Um, so that's that. Now let's look at a more interesting case, yeah? Uh, how are we, the previous slides, right? the Euler angles, how are we so sure that uh, alpha, are smaller? Yeah, so I mean, the, <clears throat> See the when you um, want to, um, you have, um, see, so suppose you have a rotation. So you have a rotation matrix, you know, um, like this. And, uh, and we are going to talk about that actually in other uh, lecture. So you are given a rotation matrix, then from there, you want to find out alpha, beta, gamma. And we'll, I'll tell you how to compute that because the nine here, nine here, they're similar. Um, the question is, how do we make sure? I mean, that's not, um, that's not a right question because see that we have rotated by any amount around arbitrary axis. There's no limit how much you want to rotate and what axis you want to rotate. What we want to say that either 
somebody told me what axis you rotated, what angle you rotated, I can come up with a matrix. I showed you I can rotate x axis, y axis, and so on. But now, if you don't rotate around these arbitrary axes and the principal axis x, y, z, then I want to come up with the rotation matrix. And I know the rotation matrix is this general three by three matrix, but I don't know those values. So now I'm going to say that while I can tell you whatever rotation you have done, it can be broken in a series of these three rotations around the principal axis. And those will, each of those, not the big thing, each of those will be small. So that's the, the idea that what is a simplified form of representing the rotation matrix. And that's what we are saying here. And we'll use this a lot. Um, it's a very simple model. It actually works pretty well. There was other question. Um, OK, so let's continue so you'll enjoy this thing. OK, so now so let's say we want to do the perspective transformation, which is which is more interesting, okay? So perspective transformation, we talk about that what happened x, y, z is projected to the image plane, and these are the equations. So y is minus f y upon z, x is minus f x upon z. Now the x and y coordinate are modulated depending on how far it is. So that's a real perspective transformation, and that's a real word. So if you look, if you go, you take a picture of a railroad track, you know these rails are parallel, but depending on how far you are, they will kind of appear to meet. And that's the reason that these, that they are being modified by the depth. And even though they are exactly, they are actually 56 inches, there's a, there's a regulation, the railway tracks have to be 56 inches. And, uh, but when you take a picture, you will appear to meet like that. And that's a perspective effect, okay? So that's the main difference. So now, let's say we want to find the motion, rigid motion under perspective projection. So again, the rigid motion is the same as we did before the orthograph projection. Um, so we'll get x prime in terms of rotation and translation, y prime, and so on. And, but we want to now find the image coordinates under perspective projection. We're going to assume focal length is minus 1, just to simplify and get rid of f. So then x prime will be x upper uppercase x prime divided by uppercase z prime and y prime will be uppercase y prime divided by z prime. So uppercase x, y, z are word coordinates, small x, y are the image coordinates. So you remember we, that's what we are going to do in this whole course. So don't get confused. So therefore now we have x prime from that equation here uppercase x prime, we have z prime from there, we do that, and similarly y prime here, and divide by z prime like that. And then we simplify that, divide every element here by z, just to convert them in image coordinates. And so this will become x upon z will become small x, y upon z will become small y, and z upon z will become one, and tx upon z will become like this, and we divide by z this component also, and like that you will get. So since we are dividing numerator, dividing numerator, the same thing, we can do that. So now we have the image coordinate after the motion, which are x prime, y prime, in terms of image coordinate before the motion, which is xy, and rotation matrix, and the translation, and the depth. Okay, so this is much more complicated now. So now, what we are going to notice that that this last term we have in these equations, it is the ratio of two numbers, the tz and z, or tx and z, and so on. So there's ambiguity that, you know, if I multiply, say, um, z by 2, and um, <clears throat> in other case, I divide tz by half, the same thing. 
it will it will be a same impact because of the ratio okay so therefore there won't be possible to find the translation and depth and the depth and there's always ambiguity where there are these two things so due to that um, you know so just keep that in mind now what we are going to do um, next thing now this these equations are for general scenes any scenes you know not necessarily planes and anything you know, curved and so on so what we are going to simplify we are going to say well let's say the scene is plane you know we are taking the picture of the wall it's a plane easy or the, or the table or the floor most of the things in the world are planar you know except the lights are not planar this is planar okay ceiling is planar so this is the equation of plane x plus by plus cz is equal to 1 and we can write down like this so if you multiply this vector with this this will become like this okay and um, and we have this rigid motion model x y z multiplied by rotation matrix plus translation become x prime y prime z prime after the rot and motion so we're going to combine these two things and come up with a better model and uh, since this is equal to 1 then we can just um, plug in here this thing a b c x y z this thing multiply with t so now we have x y z here x y z here we can take the common uh, and um, this is the r matrix and then this will be another matrix um, so we can sum that up and we call a matrix so now x y z multiplied by a some big matrix we get x prime y prime z prime under the assumption the scene is a planar which we have used here okay and um, so that um, a matrix is essentially that or this, is this matrix the rotation matrix which we have from here and then we get a translation vector multiplied by this vector ABC it will become 3 by 3 again because it's 3 by 1 and this 1 by 3 will become 3 by 3 and this 3 by 3 add to 3 by 3 matrices will become 3 by 3 again so um, what we have now is a more simplification that we are taking x y z and getting x prime y prime z prime and uh, therefore x bar is given by this y x prime is given by this y prime is given by z prime is given by this now this is up to here is the word we haven't taken a picture yet now we're going to take picture using the perspective projection x prime upon z prime is small x prime y prime upon z prime is small y prime okay so that's what we are going to get become x prime divided by y from z prime which is this and y prime is y prime divided by z prime like that then again we can divide each term by z to convert them to the image coordinates uh, and we'll get this this will become small x small y small m1 become small x small y 1 and so on become like that so now x prime is given as the ratio of these two terms and y prime is given ratio of these two terms. now we have nine unknowns and again as we talk about there's a scale ambiguity because the ratio uh, we cannot uniquely determine all nines so we are going to arbitrarily select one of them say a9 is a one then this transformation uh, will become like that so x prime is given a1x plus a2y plus a3 divided by a7x plus a8y plus 1 and y prime is given by like that so this is the xy is the coordinate in image 1 x prime y prime is coordinate in image 2 and this is under the assumption that we have seen as a planar under the perspective projection and this transformation can also be written as ax plus b divided by c transpose x plus 1 where a 
is that two by two matrix similar to we have an affine transformation c is a vector a7 by 8 and b is a3 a6 and like that and this transformation is called projected transformation or homography and uh, this is the general case of affine transformation okay so suppose if the c is zero here and this reduces to the affine transformation as you remember x plus b okay so and this transformation we got under perspective projection under the scene is planar with the 3d rigid motion okay so that's very nice uh, nice result um, so I think um, we are out of time uh, one or two questions in the end any any question quick question yeah Scale ambiguity in this uh, yeah. Slide, it was P over Z, right? Yeah. So here it's just uh, one. Yeah. So for C, the here, as you see, now we want to describe this motion the way it is is by nine elements: a1, a2, a3, up to a9. Yes, like that. So say given two images, given these two points x, y, and x prime, y prime for many points, we want to find that these nine unknowns. The way it is, since this is a ratio of these two terms, there's no way we can find all the nine elements uniquely. There is ambiguity. As I told you, I can multiply by twos, you know, the numerator and divide by half numerator, these values will change. So therefore, due to numerator denominator, there's no unique way I can determine those all lines. But now, if I'm going to select one of them, just one, let's say, you no, know, this is one, then rest of the eight will be uniquely determined. So that's the point. That's called scale ambiguity because of this ratio. Okay? So, um, so that's called the, the homography and you know, under perspective adjacent. So, so see that the, the, the idea is that you want to fully understand the way we have derived and you should be able to do that, sit on a desk, blank piece of paper, you can drive the whole thing. How? Because first is we talk about the rigid 3D motion can be expressed by 3D rotation, 3D translation. 3D rotation can be expressed by 3 by 3 matrix. You take x, y, z, map it to x prime, y prime, z prime. That's one thing. Second thing that we talk about when we take a picture, x, y, z is mapped to small x, small y. Under perspective projection, it is minus fx upon z. Y is minus fy upon z. Simple thing, the triangles. We assume focal length is minus 1, just to simplify thing. So therefore, you get the, after the motion, you get the, um, this thing, x prime, y prime, z prime. Now, from here, you want to get the image coordinates. And in order to get image coordinate definition is x prime divided by z prime. So you already know x prime, you know z prime, you find that. You convert them to the image coordinate, then you have the x prime, y prime, z prime. And then you do these reasonings, say, well, there's no way we can determine t, z, and z. You can simplify and you can come up with the what we got here that while we can do one more simplification, assume it's a plane and we can actually simplify this further 
because this is one we can put in here and then become again a matrix you know maybe bigger matrix same size and do again x prime y prime z prime like this get the image coordinates again same way x prime upon z prime and um, reason that there's a scale ambiguity and we can choose one of those as one and um, then come up with this and that's it and then we can say well if if this is zero a78 is zero then this is actually a fine transformation and um, we can write down like that so it's a very simple things step by step if you build on you could you could do that and that's the way the signs work that you have one fact the next fact like that you keep building and, and try to feel comfortable i think we are running out of time okay so we'll stop here thank you the um, homography and this can also be written as a matrix a vector another vector and another vector and so on and this is a matrix two by two matrix this is a vector two by one and so on so this is a very important transformation between two images so the saying give me a point in one image which is x y i will find out same point in the next image x prime y prime which is given by that so these two images are related by that and in this as you see we don't see any depth we don't see any word coordinates uh, it's based on images but the way we derived using the assumption that the, up, the camera is moving in 3d the scene is planar and all this thing under perspective projection so that's the idea that we want to do that and other thing you will notice here that this uh, is actually a special case i mean this is a general case of the affine transformation so if the c is zero then this whole thing will disappear then we will have x prime is equal x plus b and that was a fine transformation um, so this um, thing is more general and a fine transformation has only six unknowns this has nine unknowns okay and also this is kind of capturing the rotation um, um, and other things and then this is like a translation and this is capturing the more effect of the perspective projection so um, so now let's look at practical problem let's say we have two images and uh, we find these points and these are like shift points and you know how to find the shift points and we find shift points here shift points here and also you can match them you say well i take a shift vector here shift descriptor and uh, find what's the best match of that shift descriptor you will find is the best match here for this one will be best match and so on so you have correspondence also now given these correspondences we want to know how we can estimate those eight parameters of the projector transformation okay so then once we know that then we can take any point from here we can map it to point on the right image and so on so that is called finding registering two images or finding a transformation from one image to other image and what we have discussed is that we can say well we can find the we can register two images using the say homography or the the um, projector transformation but now we have derived this thing that how we reach at that equation we have come we have assume that there's a 3d motion there's a planar projection planar assumption and there is perspective projection all those things give us these two equation and it's more meaningful okay so so now how we will do that um, it'll be easy that we can actually use a least square fit as we talked about that um, we can if we have the um, <clears throat> Um, more equation than unknown we can always use least square fit so um, we did this in the lucas canade algorithm where we are computing uv there were two unknowns we are looking at the three by three neighbor we are looking at nine equations we can do that and this can be done like fitting a st straight line you know let's say we know the equation of a straight line which is mx uh, plus c is equal to y and we have bunch of points you know these points 
So if these points have to lie on the line, they have to satisfy these equations. So we, for each point, we get one equation. We get n equations. And we can put in this uh, matrix form as we did for Lucas Kanade. So these are the knowns, x and y known for each of the point. M and C we want to compute. This thing is not a square matrix, so we will uh, find a transpose of that, multiply on both sides, and we can now invert this and this is the solution of the line of fitting the points. Yes? Uh, you were showing earlier, so we have, uh, we have a point and we have a line going through that point. How do we find that line? Is that one of the lines that we uh, put across like two images as you showed in the image before? No, that one, yeah, that one we were saying that you will be given two images, mm -hmm. you will apply your shift point detector you'll find these uh, five points. Mm -hmm. And you will find hopefully five points in this image. Then you say, well, I want to find the match of the point number one in, from one image to other image. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? You have learned shift descriptor. That you can take a descriptor here, 128 dimensional vector, and take first descriptor, first point and say, is it close to this? Second point is close to this, third point is close to this, fifth point, whichever is closest, so that's a match. So that's the way you will find the match. Okay? Yeah. I'm more worried about the, in the next slide when you say we have a line through that point. Where does that line? No, no, no. I mean, so there are two different concepts. Here they're saying this is a problem we want to solve. Okay? Now, the way in this thing, given two images, the points and their matches, we want to fit the projected transformation to these images. We want to register these to find those, the eight unknowns we have. Mm -hmm. So in order to find those eight unknowns, we are going to use a process called least square fit, which we did in Lucas Canade, and which can be also used in fitting a line to a bunch of points. So that's a separate thing than this one. Yeah. Okay? Okay. So, so let's say we have the correspondences and we understand the least square fit. Again, it's a very, very important notion. You need to be very comfortable with this because we are going to use this again and again. Okay? So this is nothing new, but you need to feel very comfortable what is the least square fit and what we are doing here. So let's say you, you do that. Then the determining projector transformation using point correspondences, two images. Given two images, given points, given the correspondences, which point belongs to which point, then we want to talk about how we can estimate these eight A's which are in this projector transformation, okay? So as you remember, these are the equations. X prime is equal to this, Y prime is equal to this, and our aim is that we want to find these eight unknowns. Then we have this transformation. And for, uh, we can rewrite like this, the first equation, we can multiply x prime with this. We get this one on the left side, and this is there. And similarly, for the uh, <coughs> y, we can multiply this with this thing, y prime, we get this. We can um, do like that. x prime is equal to this from the first equation, and y prime is equal to this. So these are the two equations in this we have eight unknowns. And uh, we will have several points, and this is just saying, well, x prime was here, on the left now I can write right to make it simpler, y prime was here, we can write right, right, so we get these two equations. So now for each point i, I'll get these two equations. Uh, and as you saw there, I have five points. I, I can have six points. I can have eight points. So each equation, each point give me two, two rows in this matrix. And um, all these are knowns because I know the location of the points in the image one, which is X and Y. I know the corresponding point in image two, which is X prime, Y prime. And um, so this side is known. This side is known. The unknown is this. And the way it is, because if I take this one, multiply with this, I'm going to get this first equation. If I take this, multiply with this, I'm going to get second equation. So um, that's what um, we have here. So now uh, this is the same problem, because we have um, 
you know, more um, with these points, we will have, say, five points, we'll have 10 of these rows, okay, because each gives two rows. Then we have nine, um, eight unknown, so we can actually solve it. Um, so that's what we are going to do. We'll again call this as a big matrix A, so A vector, then X prime, and this we will multiply transpose on both sides with a pseudo inverse, and that's the way we are going to find these unknowns. So exactly same way as we did Lucas Canade, exactly the same way as we fit a line to the points, now we have a transformation between two images. So we can now take any point in the first image, we can find corresponding point in the second image. And that's called registration. Okay? So that's uh, what we know now. And the limitation of this is that we need to know the points uh, we need to know the match points. We need to apply a shift detector to get the points. We need to have a shift descriptor to match. Then it's pretty easy. Just do that. But that's, you know, itself requires these steps. So we are going to talk about actually like, next lecture that can we do without the points and without the matches, uh, which is called direct method to estimate the same transformation, which is more interesting. Okay, so that's that. So, so to summarize what we have talked about, the given two images, uh, how can we relate those two images? Uh, simplest model will be this translation, that we have a point x, y in the first image. That same point in the second image is displaced, translated by some amount b1 and b2. The little more complex will be that while it's translated, and also rotated, and rotation is around z-axis, and this is a rotation matrix we talk about, you know, that is by angle theta, so x cos theta, y sin theta, and so on. So this is called also rigid transformation. So when you uh, have a rigid object, it can have the translation and rotation. Um, then the more general cases, which is a fine transformation. Uh, which has the rotation, the scaling, and shear, and lots of other things. And that has the four unknowns here, and two unknowns here, six unknowns. Uh, then the projected transformation has the eight unknowns, and this was under the orthograph projection. This is under the perspective projection using the planar assumption. And um, then there are approximation of this transformation, because this is a nonlinear so numerator and denominator is always hard to deal with. This is a linear, so there's no numerator and denominator, so it's easier to compute uh, these unknowns. This is the nonlinear, and we are able to do that using least square fit because we assume points are known and their corresponds known. But if they are not known, then it's harder. Um, so now, what are the approximation of this? Well, what we are going to do that anything which is nonlinear, we can linearize by using the Taylor series. Remember, we talk about Taylor series. We can approximate any function uh, by using the first order derivative, second order derivative, and so on. And uh, if we do that, then this is approximation of. Um, projective transformation, it's called biquadratic. So we have up to second order terms here. And this is uh, as many unknowns, we have 12 unknowns. And, uh, um, but still it's better than this one because this does, has a, this has a numerator denominator. This is just, you know, like uh, all the numerator terms. So this is called biquadratic approximation of projective transformation. So if you want to do that, it will be easier to compute, but we'll have to compute 12 unknowns. Uh, here we only compute 8 unknowns. Now we can simplify that um, and uh, come up with a bilinear transformation, which is the approximation of the above, where we can remove all the square terms. X square, Y square remove, but we keep the X, Y term so this uh, is another model which is very popular bilinear model and this has eight unknowns 
um, and the so here we are removing square terms and the other one is called pseudo perspective so we are <laughs> going to remove one square term uh, and use the same coefficient uh, for two terms from the above by quadratic and will turn like, like this so you still have a1, a2, x, a3, y and a4, x square but we won't have y square and then we will have x, y and f i x y then the second one a6 and a7 x and all up to y then we have x y and um, then we have y square we don't have the x square and as you see the terms for the x square and x y are the same and um, then similarly x y from the first equation and the second equation y square they are the same so we are kind of constraining these terms to reduce the number of unknowns here so the, again we have 8 compared to 12 there and this is a pseudo perspective transformation and we are going to talk about this uh, a little later um, so all these are different transformation between two images and they are not just equations we have derived those and we know what do they represent and how we end up you know with those terms and we are going to use them to remove the global motion and registering making a mosaic and all those things we have talked about okay so um, so the translation is very simple model and uh, you can do the simple block based matching um, locally translation is is fine but it will not capture the zoom it will not have a scale uh, it will just say this thing translated and no rotation no pan tilt um, then rigid has a rotation and translation which is better but it still doesn't have zoom and rotation is around only z axis so it doesn't have rotation on other axis it's not capturing um, so a fine has the rotation it has the um, it does not capture the its rotation is only around z axis um, but it is it is exact in orthograph projection as we talked about before um, and um, the perspective has the eight parameters as you saw and that is um, kind of you know exact in a way that when we do the 3d motion there are three parameters for rotation there are three parameters for translation six and there can be scaling in x y so the eight parameters so in a way it's capturing um, most of the things but as you saw that's difficult to estimate because of numerator and denominator um, and uh, by quadratic is obtained by secondary Taylor series as you saw it has 12 parameters and another approximation of this is bilinear we obtain from quadratic model by removing the square terms and then it is um, most widely used but there's no any physical phenomena which will relate to this bilinear just a convenience it's, it's, it's nicer doesn't have you know many terms and doesn't have square terms um, then pseudo perspective is um, another approximation and it has less unknowns and um, it, it is used uh, different things we'll talk about that so this is another you know graphical demonstration of this that you know in the image one we have something like that this translate becomes like that rotation you are rotating on z-axis uh, this is shear that you know you are scaling in different uh, direction and then rigid transformation just rotation and translation and affine captures all those it has the you know all of those things um, so this is from the Zaliski's book and uh, this is another way to demonstrate that you know if you have the original one is here the translated version can look like that and um, then the Euclidean which is a rigid transformation can look like that rotation translation 
uh, this is affine, this is projective, and then there's another transformation called similarity, which has the rotation, translation, the scaling also. Okay, so this is you know this will have two far rotation. Uh, I mean four far rotation, or uh, you can say two far rotation, one far scaling, and two far translation will be five parameters. Rigid will have you know the two far rotation and then rotation angle which will be one parameter so actually we have a table which says that uh, so before that let's you know look into this um, very important notion called homogeneous coordinates so if i have uh, uh, x y z then these are normally called cartesian coordinates uh, i can convert them to the homogeneous coordinates by taking x, y, z, converting it to the four-dimensional vector and taking a scalar k multiplying with each of this become kx, ky, kz and adding the fourth component of the vector. So this is called from the Cartesian coordinate to the homogeneous coordinate. And this kind of thing is very useful to manipulate these different transformations. So knowing that, then we can go from Cartes uh, homogeneous coordinates to the Cartesian coordinates, which are inverse homogeneous, by taking the fourth component, dividing each of the component by the fourth, and mapping the four-dimensional vector to three-dimensional vector. So it's just the same thing. In the first one, we multiply, edit an extra component, and this one, we took the four component, take the fourth one, divide by that. And that's the inverse of that. And it's very convenient. Uh, <clears throat> so now let's say we want to write down the translation in that homogeneous coordinate system. So we can write down like this. So we have translation now is two by three matrix. The real translation is B1, B2. And uh, the homogeneous coordinate of the point is x, y, and 1. So the fourth, fourth or third component in this case is 1. The k is 1. So as you see, if you multiply x, y, 1 with 1, 0, b, become x plus b, 1, which is the first. Next one will be y plus b, 2, which is the second equation. So this uh, is exactly the same as this. So this is a much compact representation of these two equations. And we'll try to put all these transformations in this format. And that's why we are doing this. OK? So these are homogeneous coordinates. So translation is like that. And we can define this as a, as a function, which is the function is um, um, the p is a parameters. So we have two parameters, b1, b2. And it is taking the uh, vector x and mapping it to another vector x prime. And vector x is x, y, and x prime vector is x prime, y prime. And uh, this is the another way that we have a matrix here in this one. Um, so let's say we have now the rigid transformation, the translation, b1, b2, and the rotation on z-axis. Um, we can also write down this like this. It's a function. So we take um, um, the parameter vector here will be theta and b1, b2. We will get the x prime, y prime. This is the x prime and this is the y prime. So it will, given a vector x, y, and the parameter, give you the new vector x prime, y prime. And this also can be written in a matrix form. Now, so the rotation and the translation is given by this. So here we have translation. And this one now is cos theta sine minus sine theta sine theta cos theta. So again, this is the 2 by 3 matrix. So here there was no rotation, just translation. Now we have rotation and translation. So we can put this in the same framework. Um, and we can say this is the 
R. This is the R matrix and then this is a T vector which is translation. So this is the 2 by 3 matrix. And we can also um, take the affine which is more general than previous two. So now we don't have just rotation, we have more things, scaling and shear and all those things which are all jumbled together. So that will become like this. The function is it's a vector value function given x, y, we can find out x prime, y prime like this. This is x prime, this is y prime, and these are the parameters. In this case, parameters are a1 to a2 and a3 and a4 and b1, b2. And we can write down this in a matrix form like that. So matrix now is a1, a2, b1, a3, and a4. So I should put that. Can I get out of this? Is it okay? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, well, let, me, let me finish first, first this one. In the last class, uh, we deduced the affine transformation from the orthogonal pro projection. Yeah. yeah. In this projection, it seems the uh, x and the uh, x and the world coordinate and the image coordinate is the same. But now the affine transformation, uh, including the scale information, zooming. So I I can't quite understand this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was supposed to be A4, which we did that. Yeah, repeat again, what were you saying? Uh, in the <laughs> mm -hmm. projection, uh, the uh, world coordinate x and uh, the image coordinate uh, small x is uh, equal mm -hmm. by uh, what, uh, the world coordinate uh, y and the, the uh, small y is yeah. equal. So why there are still a, a, a change in skills? Skill change in a faint transformation. You said it's uh, including the uh, rigid, mm -hmm. rigid uh, move, move, uh, rotation, rigid, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, translation, yeah. and also uh, scaling, and uh, uh, all of, yeah. kind of this. But the, what what the scale come from? Yeah, yeah. So see the what uh, we started. We talk about say well we have a. 3D model and we can represent the rigid transformation, 3D rotation, 3D translation, and we talk about how to represent rotation, eye is all these things, you know, this general thing. Then we talk about that um, we have, you know, we have to take pictures and what are the different um, different models we use. You know, we can use the uh, orthographic, we can use the projective and all this thing. So using this rigorously, these models, we came up with, if we use the orthographic projection, then the transformation, we can relate these two with, uh, uh, with the, um, <coughs> using the affine transformation. So under orthographic projection, rigid motion, it is the um, uh, affine transformation is correct. And the assumption there was that the x and y, which are uppercase x and y, and then small x and small y, they are not being impacted by the depth. So they are, can be approximated, they are very similar or some scale version of the x, y. As I gave you an example, when you take a picture from UAV, the distance from the UAV to the buildings or the road is very, very high compared to actually height of people. So, so roughly we can say they are equal or they are a scale version, but they don't depend on the depth. So using that assumption, we say that affine transformation is capturing the most of the transformation from one image to other image and it has these six unknowns, the two by two matrix and also the translation. So there is no harm to, I mean, I, I never mentioned that there is a, a scale um, thing. I actually actually said that either they are equal or they are a scale version, they are approximately equal. So what we are now talking about a scale is an image. See, there is a scale in the image, what you are talking about, that when you go to x and y in the word, from there to the image, small x, small y. That's one mapping, which is where, that's where we are using orthographic projection. Now here, 
we have image one and image two, then one image is taken uh, at this and another image is coming to this. So the scale has changed in the image. One object appeared this much, another object appeared this much. So this is, you know, once we talk about say, well, one way to model transformation between two images under these assumption is uh, affine and now we want to look at say what affine can provide us because affine is more general this matrix we got is a two by two matrix it is it is not the the just the rotation matrix as you saw it is a diff, you know it is general terms because rotation matrix has particular property so that's the reason we can actually recover it can capture the scale can capture the shear can capture the rotation and so on okay so so i mean i you know don't assume they're exactly same it is never the case the world coordinate in this uh, image coordinate because image is you know 256 by 256 the world is meters and so on there's lots of you know things going on but the main thing is they are not being impacted by the depth because it's so distant is so far and there's some scale version the uppercase small case x is some scale version of the uh, uppercase x similarly for y okay okay any other question yeah Just one yeah uh, small question mm -hmm. so but uh, for most of our uh, transformations when mm -hmm. we're looking at the world uh, with pinhole camera mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about the scale, right? It's all just because as long as we keep the camera ratio mm -hmm. the first one the same, yeah. uh, it's always going to be just rotation and translation. No, I mean, see that as you see that when there is the um, projection, mm -hmm. so under the optical projection, there is the scale thing because it will depend on the how far the camera is from the object. It's the scale by the distance, right? If we keep the scale the same by looking at the same frustrum, we can just assume that the change that's between two images is only because of the distance. Yeah, I mean, so, so see, the one is that the scale is also captured in the focal length, as you saw this, you know, the triangle. Yeah. Yeah, it it depends on the you know focal length. How what is yeah, the focal length and so. If that remains constant. Yeah. If it's your camera to be uh, always have the same uh, scale. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about scaling, right? I mean, what what do you mean when you say don't worry about scaling? What does it mean? Uh, it, what I mean is like if you take two pictures. Yeah. And you fix your camera so it's the same one taking. Same the same focal length. Yeah. Uh, same between those two pictures, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't have to worry about scaling, right? You can yeah, I mean, so see that you can you can take two pictures, you can find out all the information, which is you can find the 3D motion, mm -hmm. you can find the depth, and uh, you can even find the focal length and so on. So uh, there are methods to which you will do that. And but could you ignore it though, assuming that you didn't change the scaling, you wouldn't need to worry about scaling factor in the image itself, right? Because the world didn't shrink or expand, uh, it just moved. No, I mean, scaling, see, scaling will provide you information that how much you have moved and what's the distance from the camera to scene, because that's one. That one would be translation, though, right? No, no, whatever it is, you can see that you have one picture yeah. and you move, and that motion can be, you know, translation, rotation, <laughs> this, this, this translation, or this translation, and so on. All those things. Uh, give you cues that you can find out the what is the motion in 3D mm -hmm. and what is the depth, the X, Y, Z of each of the points. Yes. And in that model, and we're going to talk about that, that you have to have captured the minimum, you have to capture the focal length. Now, if the focal length is same mm -hmm. in this image and that image, then you can just estimate once. Okay. Uh, but you don't have to worry right. about, because see the 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 um, this uh, estimation you will get will be up to scale factor. That's another thing that there won't be absolute, you know, because right. and then if you know the scale of something, suppose if you know the the typical height of a person, then you can use that to find this right. true Euclidean you know distances between those points, 
and that's possible. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, but the, the object could actually, or the person could actually move away, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. at that point, my depth is getting bigger, and my yeah. and the person, so this, the scale would change. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, see, the, somehow there's a misconception about the scale, so you guys are mixing different things. So what we are saying that when you take two pictures and you want to estimate what is called the structure from motion, the 3D rotation, 3D translation from two pictures, and also the depth for each point. So in that case, the, when the person is moving in front of the camera, then that change in scale actually provides you, help you to find these parameters. So it, cha it will change, then that's, that's good. I mean, it will provide you. So why, you know, it's not a problem. But now the question is that can you find the absolute size of the objects in, the, in these two images? Because whatever these you will get, they'll be relative. So, so when you, when you, you know, take a, take a picture, there is a house and there is, you know, there are these points and there are windows and doors and so on. You can find all these things, uh, but you won't be able to find the absolute values of all these three inches or 10 inches and so on. In order to find that, then you need to know at least one uh, known scale. Say, well, there's a person, I know its length is, typical person has five feet length, now I can, you know, scale, I can use that scale to find the actual sizes. So those are the things. So that's unless it's a toy house. Huh? Unless it's and a toy the, house. And the word court toy, toy house. Toy house. Yeah, I mean in toy house also you need to know. So there, you know, um, then you will find these things about the toy house. You know. The scale will yeah. be different. Yeah. Different. No, no. My, in the, yeah, in that case, you know, if you have something, there's a toy huh? house and there's a person. Yeah. So person, you know, typically. Typically, what the person now person is a toy also, then you have a problem. Exactly. So you have to use some fact uh, to you know which you can use. And sometimes what happens, you show the person, and person knows. Say, well, these two points, I know this much the distance. Then you can use that. I can use that even if let's say the person is much closer to the camera than the. Yeah, person. yeah, no problem. See that because it's absolute length, is it right? You want to look at say a person is five feet tall. So it doesn't matter that person is five feet tall, if it's closer uh, like that. We already found, we already f make fact of that, that when you have projection, the image, if it's closer or farther, it will be changed according to the depth. Depth is Z's on the denominator. But I do need to know then the depth. I, need, I do need to know how much further that house is. Yeah, I mean, that's what we are going to compute. See, that we are going to compute Given these equations, we are going to compute the depth for each point. We are going to compute 3D rotation. We are going to compute 3D translation. That problem is called structure for motion. Remember, I showed you the photosynth, that first video, that we are taking these pictures and defining points, and we are computing that. So that's the very classic problem called structure for motion. You can compute that. What in this context we are talking about, you won't know the exact size of these toy houses or people and so on, you will know the only relative. In order to find the true sizes, you have to know at least one metric, then you can propagate that. So that is one concept. The other concept, what he asked, is the scale that you, know, you have two images and um, in this, the same object, you zoom in in this image compared to this one, then a fine transformation will take care of it. It will estimate this two by two matrix, which will do scaling, which will do rotation, which will do shear and so on. Because, see, the, what, is, what, what the scale is doing, that you will do is scaling, you will change in X and Y, is right? So there is the sum constant s will be multiplied in the x coordinates some constant may be the same scaling in x and y or different scaling will be multiplied in the y direction so now there will be a product of 
the angle theta and the scaling and so on, it will be captured in, in that. And actually that is called the similarity transformation. So similarity transformation is a special case of the fine transformation and the, um, the rigid transformation is even further special case of a fine transformation because rigid is only rotation and translation. Then similarity transformation is scaling, rotation and translation. Affine is everything because these numbers we have the A1, A2, A3, they can be any numbers. And we all estimate those four. So whatever you can capture with this, it is capturing, and you will verify that that's the case. Okay, so, so let's move on. And um, so then we have the um, projective transformation. So again, it has these parameters, which are eight parameters, and um, this again can be written as a function that x is the argument and p is a parameter then we map to x prime y prime as shown above and uh, this can be written as a matrix like this so a1 to um, a, a4 then b1 to b2 and c1 c2 then as you see that these are the homogeneous coordinates you multiply this with that which will you get the first row then divide by the fourth com third component you multiply this with that that will become and multiply this with second row you'll get this one and divide by this third component you'll get this one so this indeed is that projected transformation so now see we have put all these in the same framework we have a matrix each matrix is two by three and we are putting the homogeneous coordinates and um, what we are seeing here that um, the for the translation the first two by two matrix identity now we'll go one zero zero and the, then we have translation vector and it has two degrees of freedom translation x translation y okay and uh, it will only preserve the rota orientation of the lines so if you take this thing it will it will not change then we have um, the um, rigid which is a euclidean transformation it has the rotation and the translation. So the instead of identity, we have now rotation matrix, which is cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta, the rotation on z axis. And we have same b1, b2, the um, translation. And this now has three degrees of freedom because one is a rotation, how much rotation you are doing, theta, and a two for translation, okay? And this will preserve the length. If you rotate in the image plane, then the length of these will not change, okay? So then we have the similarity transformation as you are saying, now this has a scale, S is a scale, and that's why it's of R, it's the S, and this S is a constant for X and Y, so they're scaling equally in X and Y direction. So um, now we have one scale, one for rotation and two for translation. We have four, four degrees of freedom, four parameters. And uh, here the angles will, will preserve, angle will not change when you do the simulated transformation because scale becomes smaller, bigger, but angles will not change, okay? So then we have a fine transformation. So that is the most general, it has six unknowns and it captures lots of things and it will preserve the parallelism, that if there are two parallel lines, then if we apply a fine transformation, they will remain parallel, okay? So then we have the projective transformation, and which is the most general. It has eight unknowns, and it's just H matrix, two by three, as you saw, and uh, here the, what only it can preserve is the straight lines will, be, will remain straight lines not all other things, it's a more general thing in the perspective projection zone. Okay? So that's a nice, and this is actually table from Zaleski's book, and in that section you can look at that. Okay, so this is, I think, same thing I already talked about. Um, so I think uh, you can look at this um, section. I go through in a lot of detail in this, my chapter about how to get rotation, how to get, you know, these rotation matrices and so on, and then this is from 
the um, Zaleski. So this will end this um,